First of all, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. And my name is Ajoa Manyara. You know me. I'm saved. Jesus is Lord and Savior. And I'm presenting this message on Christian social responsibility. I preached last Sunday on that theme. And today, for the sake of the many fellowship, I'm repeating the same. But this time, it's not a sermon, but a lesson. So we are going to go a bit deeper and wider than uh, we did last Sunday. Uh, in the past, we have thought and planned social Christian responsibility actions to the outside people and not to us in the church. But we are going to look at social, uh, Christian social responsibility as from a different angle or from a different perspective from what we have known in the past. And I would like us to look at Christian social responsibility first beginning with us, we members of Ruaraka Methodist Church. And for us to understand what it is, I'm going to look at three areas. One, at the individual, and second, at the congregation, and third, our action to the outside world. So first, the first of these areas, the individual member of our congregation in Ruaraka, that is you and me. If we are going to go out as Christian Social Responsibility Committee or in Christian Social Responsibility, we have to think first of who we are. Because if we are going to go out representing Christian uh, responsibility, Social Responsibility, then the first question that arises is this. Are we, a Christ, are you, a Christian, you, the individual? Because if we are going to go out representing Christ, then the first question is, are you a Christian? Because in acting behalf of Christian social responsibility, it means that you are a follower of Christ. And are you a follower of Christ? Otherwise, if you are not a follower of Christ, then you are masquerading as a Christian, and you are not. Now, the question is, who is a Christian? Many people give a definition of a Christian as those people who attend Sunday services in churches, or those who are baptized and they have Christian names to be the Christians. But is that the correct definition of who a Christian is? What is the biblical definition of a Christian? And for us to be able to understand that, we have to look at the Bible. And in this case, we are going to look at the Bible from Romans chapter 8. And we see who is a follower of Christ, the biblical definition. And I'm at Romans chapter 8, from beginning at verse 7. And we will go to verse 9. It says this. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law and it cannot do so. Now that is the mind of the one who is an unbeliever. The person who is not in Christ. The person who has not been saved. Verse 8. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Verse 9. You, however, now he is addressing the saved. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So, the Spirit of God, who is the Holy Spirit, when he is in a person, is the one who qualifies that person to be a Christian and to call himself a Christian. But then the question is, 
how does that happen? How does the Holy Spirit get into a person so that he becomes a Christian? And again, the Bible comes to our aid. In the Acts of the Apostles, the first sermon in the New Testament church was preached by Peter. And we find that in, first, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 2. And Peter preached a long service, or a long sermon. And at chapter 2, verse 36, verse 7, oh, sorry, verse 37, people, we find that there are people who have been convicted of their sin. Peter has preached a very lovely uh, sermon, and people have been convicted of their sins that they need to do something. And at that seven, they say, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Now they are convinced that they are sinners. They wonder, then what do we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is received when somebody confesses his sins, when he repents, when he accepts Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior, he receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he becomes a Christian. When you have accepted Jesus Christ in you to be your Lord and Savior, that's the point at which you become a Christian. Because you have heeded the call of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is calling us unto himself. And when now you accept Jesus Christ in your life, he becomes the Lord of your life. You are saved and you become a Christian. It is the responsibility then. Now when you are saved, you belong to the church of Jesus Christ. Because the church of Jesus Christ is composed of all those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if you do not have the testimony of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are not in the church of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. You are not in the church of Jesus Christ because you are not a follower of Jesus. And when you are not a follower of Jesus, you do not have the spiritual strength to follow Jesus. So the first step for you is to be saved. The first step for you is to be saved, to accept the gift of salvation, which is free. You see, it's good. Salvation is not on sale. So there is nobody who can say that he is so poor that he cannot afford salvation. He cannot afford to be saved. Salvation is free. So you will find in the Bible promises of God and he is talking of my children. I will give them this. My children. I will do that. My children. I will provide this and I will provide the other. And you wonder why my children, my children, my children. It is my children, it is my children because you are free to be a child of God. It's easy. You accept Jesus Christ in your, in your heart to be your Lord and Savior, and you are a child of God, and you start receiving the blessings that God has reserved for those who belong to Him. Now, the second area that I will look at is the church. We, the congregation, in the church, we have a responsibility to fulfill as a group, obeying the commandments of God. And by that, I mean we all, we who are saved, because we are the church. In John chapter 13, verse 34, we find 
the 11th commandment, you know of the 10 commandments, and Jesus says there to the disciples, another commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So we are commanded to love each other, we who are of the fellowship of believers, we who are saved. And he continues, you, when you love one another, the world is going to know that you belong to me. That's how the world will see that we belong to Christ and will be convicted that we belong to, to Christ. And it's there that we are also commanded to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Now, people will wonder, how do you love your enemies? My enemies, I want them dead, not me loving them. Because they are bothered to me. But the Bible says you love them, the enemies. We love them because when we receive the salvation and the Holy Spirit gets in you, he comes in with the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says the fruit of the Spirit is, and he begins with love, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine of them. But it begins with the love. Now the love that the Holy Spirit gives in your heart is not the human love. It's the love of God that is spoken of again in the Romans chapter 5, verses 5, that this, the love of God has been broadcast in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me clear it a bit when we come to love because we find it difficult because we have not understood the technicality regarding love. Greek is a very exact language, is the language of the philosophers. And we in the Bible, in English, we talk of love, 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 love. In Greek, it would be different. How many types of love are there? The love of God in Greek is known as agape. Then we have our loves, we humans. The love of our brother, we love our brother, our sister, our parents, with a different love, which is known as filio. And then we love our relatives with a different love, our uncles, our aunts, with the love that is known as stooch. S-T-O-R-G-E. And we love our wives, you know, our, yeah, our wives, our husbands, with a different love, known as Eros. Now let me go back to the love of God, which is agape. The agape love of God, when it acts in our hearts, then you love like God loves. You love without distinction. You love unconditionally. And this is where now it comes for us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us because our, the love of God is in our hearts. We have to love as God does and he is training us to be like him. He says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, be holy because I am holy. This is what God says. And it says, they are, they, it says the Lord or rather, be holy because I am holy, and that if one is not holy, he will not be able to see the Lord. Without the holiness, no one will see the Lord. Why so? It's because God is training us to be like him. We are the children of God when we are saved, and so like the Father, like the Son. And so we have to be like God. Be holy because he is holy. And with the holiness, we love as God loves. All right? But have we now as Christians, we the congregation, have we displayed our Christian character? One, have we loved one another as we are commanded in John chapter 13, verse 34? Or we are a community of gossipers slanderous, envy, bitterness, 
are we fulfilling or obeying the, the word of God to love one another? Are we loving our enemies and praying for them who persecute us? What are we doing to fulfill our Christian responsibility as a church in the church, in the congregation? We have not gone out to, the, to, the, to those people who do not belong to our congregation or Uraka, but inside ourselves. Fortunately, the women in fellowship have come out very powerfully. They have come out very powerfully in Christian social responsibility. They have given to our teachers, they have attended to our teachers, the teachers of our school, and they have given them foodstuffs and other uh, help. They have gone to see the bereaved families, they have given them money, they have prayed for them. They have gone to the mission support in the conference, and they have contributed a lot of money, 50,000 shillings. They have visited our pastors and they have given them gifts and they have prayed for them. The women fellowship have done this. And the deliverance class also have taken care of me. I'm called Mualimu and I teach them and they have taken care of me in many ways, regularly, according to their own decisions in their own way. But how about the men? Now we are addressing men. I'm addressing the men fellowship. What have we done? We, the men. The men have been asleep. Kazietu, Nyamachoma, and whatever else goes with this. Kachumbali, Kitungu Saumu, Pilipili Hoho. And we think we are done. But we are not done. We are left behind and we should wake up. We, the men. We should wake up with the men, okay? Thirdly, we come to the people outside of Christianity, and we begin with the Great Commission. Now to the outside. Our Christian social responsibility to those outside the church, to evangelize. It says, in uh, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, Go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have ever taught you. And he says, And lo, I will be with you. Have we gone out to evangelize, to baptize, to disciple by teaching them what Jesus taught us, to show concern for their welfare at all times? What we do as a church is uh, once a year during Christian social responsibility Sundays, we go out to some Nyumbaya Waze or, or some institutions that need help and we give them clothes, we give them food stuffs for one day. And then we come out of there smiling and happy, you know, like angels who are flying in for them from the realms of glory. And we have just given them something for one day. Don't you find ourselves as hypocrites? If we are giving them food for one day, what are they going to eat for the 364 days that are between then and when we come to them again? for the rest of the year. We are hypocrites and we should come out of that and sit as a fellowship of believers and a plan to do something that can touch the people outside of our congregation. We have to demonstrate our love to them. We have to invite them into our congregation. We have to invite them into our homes. Ask yourself, when did you invite your neighbor into your home when you are celebrating things like Easter, like Christmas? I know we are in Nairobi, but uh, during these celebrations, like now, we are going to the Christmas time. We are all going to go home, to our home uh, country, to our home district. Are you going to invite your neighbors? Are you going to help that poor neighbor who doesn't have enough money for the fees of their child? 
And you, you are well blessed. You have got property. Do you ever help them with 5,000, 10,000 shillings for the fees of their children? Do you invite them into your house? Do you help the poor to cope with the life who are your neighbors? That is your Christian social responsibility. Have you opened your heart for that? Yes or no? We need to look at ourselves. And then we act the way we ought to act. We should demonstrate our commitment to Christian social responsibility. And God shall open our way for us to shine in this endeavor. But we have to take the steps. And God will step in our action, will step in our circumstances, and we will be able to live the life of a, social, of a Christian social responsibility congregation. Thank you for listening to me. May God bless you.